So today we are going to be starting a brand new series to go along with our Napoleon's Marshall series. We're going to be getting into Alexander the Great on Epic History TV. Now when I started my ancient history videos, a lot of you guys recommended that I do this series from Epic History TV. I really enjoy their Napoleon series and given we're doing their Napoleon's Marshall series as well. So we've done a lot of Epic History TV recently on this channel, which is totally cool because they're they're a really good channel. Also, we don't have a hat yet for Roger and uh, our Greece videos, so we'll have to get on that. And some of you guys know that I did go through Yale's online Greek history course, so I'm not brand brand new to Greek history, but that course did not get into Alexander the great. So this is going to be my first like real exposure to Alexander the Great. I don't really know anything about him other than he was really young. He conquered what was the known world at the time. So anyway, without further ado, we'll just go ahead and jump into this. I'm looking forward to it. It will be interesting to see what this is like compared to Napoleon. And also speaking of Napoleon, I know that Alexander the Great was one of his heroes. I'm also looking forward to seeing what his military tactics were. I'm assuming we're going to be getting into some of that as well. It'll be interesting to see if there's anything similar to Napoleon. Napoleon if Napoleon took any of Alexander the Great's tactics and applied it to his own stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the video for real now. <laughs> In 334 BC, Alexander, King of Macedonia, began one of the greatest military campaigns in history against the superpower of the age. Okay, that looks like gaming footage. What game is that from? The Persian Empire. Just 20 years old, his brilliant and fearless leadership won him battle after battle. And in an astonishing 10-year campaign that took him to the edge of the known world, he carved out one of the largest empires ever known. I also want to say right here, um, looking at all of these scenes of, you know, the soldiers and everything, I have never studied military history or tactics from an ancient point of view before. So I feel like the 1700s and 1800s are about as far as I go back studying military stuff. So I am more familiar with more modern tactics and equipment and so forth, even though I feel like I'm not that familiar with it, but I'm way more familiar with it than I am with this. This, I have no idea what to expect when it comes to ancient warfare. So that's another thing that I'm looking forward to with this. Few men have had such a massive impact on the course of history. To the Persians, he was Alexander the Accursed. But to the West, he was immortalized as Alexander the Great. <clears throat> Ancient Greece. From around 500 BC, this rugged land was the scene of remarkable developments in art, philosophy, and warfare. Its two greatest city-states were Athens, a naval Inspiring. power where democracy, art, drama, and philosophy flourished, and Sparta, an austere militaristic society famed for its formidable army. In 480 BC, these two city-states had joined forces to fight an invasion by the mighty Persian Empire. Okay, I do remember this from that Yale course. Um, so yeah, I remember Athens and Sparta because they were always like rivals with each other. I know that. Um, so this was kind of like a rare instance where they came together to fight off the Persian Empire. So yeah, I do recall that from, from the Yale course. It's been a few years since I went through that course as well, so I've probably forgotten a lot of it. This I do recall. At the narrow pass of Thermopylae, a small Greek force led by 300 Spartans held up the enormous Persian army for three days before they were finally encircled and killed. I mean, that just looks like a mess. 
looks like a huge mess. And what would be terrifying is to like being stuck right in the middle of that and just have like swords and all kinds of stuff just flying around you. Like I would pretty much think I was dead at that point. Like you, how do you even get out of that? I don't think you do. <laughs> that would just like, like this is what I mean by like modern war warfare is terrifying enough in and of itself, but at least you're not like doing this stuff, you know? At least you can be hundreds of yards away, even miles away from your, from the enemy and, you know, kill them. Whereas here, like, I mean, you just had to like charge into the middle of everything and hope that by some chance you make it out alive. But I just don't see how anybody makes it out alive with, with this sort of stuff going on. Then in the Straits of Salamis, the Greek fleet defeated the Persian Navy. Whoa, look at this boat. So I think they had, they had like men down below, right, doing the oars. And then you had, the, I guess, these guys on top fighting the ancient, ancient version of the Navy. Look at these ships, though, in the background, too. Wow. Like, for the time, it's pretty impressive, actually, <laughs> this engineering. The ships look... I mean, I'm assuming they look like this. How do they know that the ships look like this? Is there, did, they, did people like have paintings of them from back in that time so that we can get an idea for what they looked like? Or do we just have like um, text descriptions of what they looked like and this is just an artist rendering of it? Because for like 400 BC or whatever, he said this was 480 BC, this is super impressive actually. It's weird though that this ship has like a, it looks like a box almost that the oars are coming out of. This one in the middle here and then this one below it doesn't have that. It almost looks like the same ship, <laughs> like a weird, I guess those are two different ships, yeah. So I'm assuming one is like a Persian design and one is a Greek design and I'm not sure which is which. I'm also noticing all of these shields have different symbols on them of animals and plants it looks like maybe so are those like symbols of gods or what what do those um designate basically but they couldn't prevent the persians burning the sacred temples of the athenian acropolis the next year at plataea the greeks won a decisive land battle against the persians and forced them to abandon their invasion I'm assuming the Persians are are the ones in like the more just the I don't know what you call it, the wraps and the soft dress and the Greeks are the ones in the armor that we're seeing. Um, I'm assuming those are like Spartan soldiers as well. What I don't recall from Yale. So are most of these soldiers supplied by Sparta um, or does Athens have its own soldiers that it you know offered as well for this stuff? I don't really recall what the partnership was exactly between the two. The next 50 years were the golden age of classical Greece. But rising tension between Athens and Sparta and their allies eventually led to war, dragging the Greek world into decades of destructive fighting. Wars between the Greek city-states continued for almost a century, leaving them exhausted and vulnerable to a new rising power to the north. For centuries, sophisticated Greeks had viewed the mountainous kingdom of Macedonia as a backwater, Hicksville, barely Greek at all. <laughs> but under King Philip II, Macedonia emerged as a formidable military force. That's interesting Urged to me that Philip is a Macedonian, I guess a Macedonian name, maybe? It's crazy how many of our like English names or English names actually come from a lot of these ancient civilizations, some of which aren't even Western, you know. ...as a formidable military force. His most famous reform, the introduction of the Sarissa, an 18-foot pike, twice the length of a normal Greek spear, and wielded by trained infantry, fighting in close formation, known as a phalanx. Do you remember the Palace? In 338 BC, at the Battle of Chironia, Philip's army crushed the joint forces of Thebes and Athens. 
through alliance and conquest, Philip had already gained control over most of his neighbours. Now, following this victory, he united all Greece in an alliance known as the Hellenic League, or League of Corinth. So he's got pretty much all of Greece at this point, except for Sparta. Also, a lot of these little islands and stuff that we see down here, um, to me, just like to my untrained eye, they don't look inhabitable, but maybe they are. Are there like little pockets of people living on these islands and stuff? With Philip as hegemon, or supreme commander. Only Sparta stood aside. Philip began to plan a great campaign a pan-Hellenic or all-Greek war against the Persian Empire. Their old foe was now an ailing superpower, its great riches ripe for the taking. Sorry, I was just looking around for Scarlet. <laughs> She's... oh, there she is. She disappeared on me for a sec. But on the eve of launching his war, Philip was assassinated by his own bodyguard victim of Macedonia's brutal court rivalries. He was succeeded by his 20-year-old son, Alexander, brilliant, restless, tutored by the great philosopher Aristotle. And all okay, well that was a twist I wasn't expecting. So Alexander the Great was actually from Macedonia and not Greece itself. Maybe that's why Yell didn't go into it then. Yeah, I had no idea. I just always assumed that he was um, from Greece. He was Macedonian. Huh. Succeeded by his 20-year-old son, Alexander. Brilliant. Restless. Tutored by the great philosopher Aristotle. And already an experienced military commander. Alexander. Okay, so Aristotle was Greek, right? So he was tutored by Aristotle. So I guess after Macedonia kind of took over everything, Aristotle would have been living in the, I don't know, what you call this, the Macedonian Empire. So I guess he would have been uh, working with um, the Macedonians. I, I don't know. Already an experienced military commander. Alexander inherited his father's grand plan to invade Persia. But first, he had to secure his own position as king. At home, he had potential rivals executed, then crushed rebellions in Illyria, Thessaly, and central Greece. He made a special example of Thebes, completely destroying the ancient city and... Okay, so definitely not benevolent. <laughs> ...selling its people into slavery. Okay. In the spring of 334 BC, now ready to launch his war against the Persian Empire, Alexander led his army across the Hellespont into Asia Minor. It... What is the Hellespont? Is that the uh, water right there, or is that um, a point of land right there? Also, the Gaul of Macedonia is not that big of an empire, and it's trying to take on the Persians. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming it, it works, right? Because I know Alexander took over, like I said, what was the known world. So this is going to succeed, I'm, I'm assuming. But my gosh, like, you have to have some gumption. It was the start of one of the greatest military campaigns in history. So at this point, is Greece basically non-existent? Because I'm assuming this is just considered Macedonia at this point. Macedonian Empire. The Greek Empire, except for Sparta, doesn't really exist anymore. Or Greece doesn't exist anymore. Is that how this is, how this is working? Alexander's army was about 40,000 strong, drawn from all parts of Greece. The infantry were commanded by the veteran Macedonian general Parmenion. In the okay, so we're looking at... I've seen this before, I think, in just movies or something. Uh, so we have, like, the first two, two lines here who have the spears out straight. 
the third line back has them at like a 45 degree angle and then everybody else has theirs just standing up straight. So I'm assuming that's just like the common the common infantry uh, formation, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And also we have a diagonal line happening right here going across. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually very formidable to, to look at. Like if I was the enemy and I saw all of that, um, no thanks, no thank you. In the front rank, 9,000 Macedonian. The infantry were commanded by the veteran Macedonian General Parmenia. In the front rank, 9,000 Macedonian phalangites, armed with the 18-foot Sarissa. These were professional soldiers, well-trained and drilled, who formed up for battle in the phalanx, 16 ranks deep. This packed formation how heavy were those 18 foot spears or I don't know if they're, they're not, probably not called spears. He just said what they were called and I don't remember. It seems like they would be pretty heavy and pretty top heavy. So that would be kind of hard to like hold it on the back like that and be able to hold up 18 feet, you know, of that. Battle in the phalanx, 16 ranks deep. This packed formation presented a solid wall of iron spear tips and was virtually unstoppable. But it was also difficult to manoeuvre, and highly vulnerable to attacks on its flanks or rear. Mm. So 3,000 elite infantry, the hypaspists, or shield bearers, armed with shorter spears, guarded its flanks. They okay. were commanded by Parmenion's son, Nicanor. The second line of Alexander's army was made up of 7,000 Greek allies and 5,000 mercenaries, armed hoplites. as hoplites. I've heard of they the hoplites before. They took their name before. from the hoplon, their large round shield, and carried shorter eight-foot spears. I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking about this compared to like modern day soldiers. Like, this is all you've got. You've got a helmet, you've got a shield, and you've got a spear, and that's it. Like, not a lot to fight with, not a lot to protect yourself with. I guess they have a little bit of body armor on as well, but man, it's amazing how far we've come when it comes to warfare. A hoplite phalanx was not as effective as the Macedonian phalangites, but still well armed and heavily armored for the time. Okay, so he's he's um, equating the phalanx with Macedonia, but in, in the Yale course, I was taught that it was a Greek thing. So did the Greeks not also have the phalanx? Or, well, I think in the beginning of this, they said that they did when they were fighting off the Persians. So maybe it was like a, a, both Macedonia and Greece had it. Sorry, I'm pausing a lot. I just, I just have stuff keep popping into my head. The Agrianes were the army's elite skirmishers, expert javelin throwers from what's now southern Bulgaria. Other skirmishers from Thrace and Illyria were armed with javelins, slings and bows. The shock troops of Alexander's army were the companion cavalry. 1,800 elite horsemen, armed with spear and sword, commanded by Philotas, another son of Parmenion, Alexander. Okay, so he just said that they had bows, so I'm assuming that's just like a, a bow and arrow thing. What, what popped into my head when he said that was that we, I'm, I'm assuming, like, I don't really know the, the full history of the Americas over here, and you know, the Native Americans or the Indians, like, I don't know what the proper term is these days for them, but, um, you know, they, they also had bow and arrows, and I'm wondering if there was some migration from, from this that showed the bow and arrows or took the bow and arrows over to the New World, or if they just came up with the bow and arrow themselves as well kind of simultaneously with these other cultures around the world. If so, that would be really, really interesting um, that we have two different areas of the world and we have the same weapon kind of devised two very different cultures. I don't know, just kind of a, an interesting observation, I think. Alexander led the Royal Squadron in person. 
There were also 1,800 cavalry from Thessaly, commanded by Callas, 600 from other parts of Greece, led by Erigius, and 900 mounted scouts from Thrace and Paeonia. I mean, look at how complicated this is for that far back in history. I mean, this is carefully thought out and drawn out and planned. I wasn't expecting it to be this complicated. In, in a way, it's almost it almost feels like more complicated than what Napoleon was working with. I feel like there wasn't as many pieces to like Napoleon's army or the armies of that era compared to this. So this is, um, wow, this, this is super like, structured which it just I don't know like probably shouldn't surprise me but for like this far back in history um it just it kind of does surprise me that this much tactic and planning and thought went into warfare and maybe this was kind of unique to Alexander the Great I don't know maybe or maybe this was very commonplace under Cassandra Gosh. Granicus. The great Persian Empire was divided into provinces, called satrapies. Each satrapy was ruled by a governor, or satrap. Those in Asia Minor, now threatened by Alexander's invasion, met to discuss strategy. Memnon of Rhodes, a skilled Greek general in Persian service, urged them to avoid battle with Alexander. Instead, he advised them to use a scorched earth strategy, to burn villages and crops and withdraw to the interior. Alexander's Okay, we did see this also in the, in the uh, Napoleonic Wars, so this obviously is a tactic that goes way, way back. He promised would quickly starve. It was good advice, but the satraps were unwilling to lay waste to their own provinces without a fight. So they decided to face Alexander's army at the river Granicus. The Persian army formed up behind the river, which was shallow, but 60 feet wide with steep banks. Okay, so looking at the formation of the, the Persian army looks completely different from what they're facing with the Macedonians. Okay, but these are, they're on horses up here. So we have cavalry. It looks like they're on horses maybe. Okay, so this is really interesting. Obviously very, very different tactics here. Um, also, I'm really <laughs> interested in how they're going to get across th this water back in the day. Like, is it shallow enough for them to just like cross or? Their front line was a wall of cavalry, about 10,000 horsemen from across the empire. Medes and Hyrcanians from modern Iran, Bactrians from Afghanistan, and Paphlagonians from Turkey's Black Sea coast. Behind, in reserve, were the infantry, several thousand Greek mercenaries, a common sight in Persian armies at this time. These men fought for Persian gold, and were armed with the round shield and short spear of hoplites. The Persians may have been unsure if they could trust these men in combat against fellow Greeks, and so placed them at the rear. <laughs> Alexander, determined to attack and destroy this Persian force before it could retreat, raced to the Granicus with his best troops. On his left wing, he posted Thessalian, Greek and Thracian cavalry under Parmenian's command. In so that's one thing I've noticed between, you know, this and the Napoleonic Wars. The cavalry are usually on the flanks. They're usually on the sides of, of the um, infantry. So I guess that is, they would use it to flank the other army a lot. So I guess that's why they're in that position. So we're seeing a lot of the same sort of tactics here between um, Napoleon and Alexander the Great. So, I mean, I guess a lot of uh, military tactics are just timeless, right? So you would see them at any point in history, really. In the center were the massed spears of the phalanx, 
its six divisions commanded by Perdicas, Koinos, Amintas, Philip, Meliager, and Crateros. On the right, Alexander himself, with the companion cavalry under Philotas, as well as the elite hypaspists, the Agrianis javelin throwers, and the archers. Alexander, with 13,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry in all, was probably slightly outnumbered. But ignoring advice to wait until dawn to cross the river, he ordered an immediate assault. He sent a squadron of companion cavalry to ford the river, followed by a regiment of hypaspists and the Paeonian light cavalry. What does he mean by ford the river? Does that mean to like, um, I don't know, obviously they're creating some way for the army to cross, I guess. Alexander, calling on his men to show their courage, then led his right wing across the river. How are they getting across though? Is it shallow? I guess so. As they reached the middle of the river, the Greeks came under a hail of javelins, darts and arrows from the Persian line. Those that made it to the far bank were immediately charged by the Persian cavalry. Alexander was in the thick of the fighting. He attacked where the whole mass of their cavalry and leaders were. You know, this just, it looks weird to me. It looks like they, they just like, both both sides just run up to each other and then it's, there's just like a halt to everything. And they just kind of stay in place and just are like, you know, skirmishing with each other or whatever. It looks weird. Like, it almost looks like they're standing still just kind of like, you know, Punching each I, I don't know. Maybe the Napoleonic um, stuff looks like this too, because they were probably not as much because they did actually have guns that they could shoot, you know, at, at some distance. But uh, I mean, we did see a lot of like paintings and stuff of the Napoleonic Wars where they were, you know, kind of mixed up like this fighting as well. So it probably did look pretty similar. I just didn't see any animations like this in the Napoleonic Wars. I just saw like still images pretty much. Also, it just doesn't look like there's any like really good way to fight <laughs> this. I mean, you just basically just have to like run into each other and then try to like spear each other. Like there's, I feel like there's no really good way to actually fight a war like this. Like there's only so much you can do with like tactics and stuff in this scenario when you have to like be face to face with your enemy. There's only so much you can do. As were stationed. Around him, a desperate conflict raged. Horses were jammed against horses and men against men. The Macedonians striving to drive the Persians away from the riverbank. The Persians determined to prevent them crossing and to push them back into the river. I mean, it's just a mess. Alexander's attack seemed reckless, but he was buying time for the rest of his army to cross the river, including the irresistible Macedonian phalanx. The river must have been really shallow then, for these suddenly, guys to cross. Alexander like this. was fighting for his life charged by two <clears throat> Persian nobles. Roissasis rode up to Alexander and struck him on the head with his sword, breaking off a piece of his helmet. But the helmet broke the force of the blow, and Alexander struck him down with his lance. Then from behind, Spithridates raised his sword against the king, but Black Clytus, son of Dropidus, anticipated his blow, struck his arm, and cut it off sword and all. Oh, now the Greek okay, army was across the river. So they have to do it in slow motion. Oh my gosh. And the Persian cavalry faced a wall of Macedonian spears. Most turned and fled. 
You know, it's interesting to kind of see how all of this happened, but also this is way, way more graphic than the Napoleonic Wars series where we just saw like still images and drawings of all of this stuff. I'm actually seeing horses being killed and people's arms being chopped off and blood spurting everywhere. So this is, this is great. The speed and shock of Alexander's attack meant Persia's Greek mercenaries hadn't even had time to join the battle. Alexander, in a blood rage, or possibly regarding these Greeks as traitors, ignored their appeals for mercy. Seriously? <laughs> oh the mercenaries God. were surrounded. I was not prepared for this at all. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I I had no idea that this was this was going to happen. Okay. So this this is what I'm dealing with on this series. <sighs> Look, I've watched war movies before. I've seen graphic stuff. I've seen limbs being chopped off and heads being chopped off by cannonballs and stuff like that before, but I prefer not to, to see stuff like that because it is very graphic. And I'm a bit squeamish. <laughs> if you haven't figured that out already, I'm almost afraid to like watch, <laughs> keep watching. I have to do it now. We're almost done though. Surrounded on all sides, and massive. Look at all the dead horses. Look, I know I've had people say, "Well, what about all the men?" You know, stuff like I get it, but there's something like super disturbing about dead animals because of their innocence and stuff. I know a lot of you get it too, and you understand what I'm saying. I'm not like trying to dehumanize the men who are dead as well. It's just like, I don't know. I just feel extra sorry for the animals for some reason. Alexander had won a great victory. Asia Minor now lay at his mercy. But the Persian Empire was still a land of immense wealth and power. Already, it was mobilizing its vast resources to face him. If Alexander was to conquer this empire and take his place in history, he'd next have to face Darius, King of Kings himself. King Dar Darius, that's the first time I've heard it pronounced that way. Over here, we say Darius. Of course, growing up, like going to church and stuff, and, um, you know, like reading the Bible, King Darius is definitely mentioned in the Bible. And uh, so we, we've always just heard it as Darius and not Darius. I'm not really sure what um, the correct term is for it, but if I go through um, like Latin pronunciation, I would assume, I know Darius is probably not Latin, but um, just like going on that from like ancient pronunciation, I would say Darius is probably more correct than Darius. Darius seems like a, a strange way to say it. But I don't know, like, I've learned doing a lot of these videos that um, people around the world pronounce things differently. Okay, so there we have it, our first video in the Alexander the Great series. <laughs> How many of these are there? There's four. Is there four? So it'll be really, really interesting for me to see how Alexander the Great accomplishes this. And again, just like learning more about ancient warfare, I was not prepared for the like graphic stuff happening in this. <laughs> so I'm a little wary of that, but um, we're going to push through this. We're going to push through it. So if you can answer any of my questions, I would appreciate it. Just comment below. And also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like and subscribe. If you want to suggest a hat for, for Roger, I was thinking, you know, with, with Greece, the like the, the wreath type thing, but maybe there's a better one for him. He's already got like a Roman helmet, so we don't want to like copy that too much. We're going to wrap up this video, but again, make sure you join us next time for part two and all the other videos that we do on this channel. Thanks for watching as always, and Roger and I will see you next time.